Good morning. The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today, and I now recognize myself for four minutes for an opening statement. Today's hearing is entitled Fostering Financial Innovation, How the Agencies Can Leverage Technology to Shape the Future of Financial Services, and the story of America is about technological innovation and the application of the American work ethic and capital over our 250-year history. Steam, rail, telephone, air, radio, television, fission, IT, the chip, all these things, vaccines, all are because we allow innovation, we facilitate it in our society. 
Today, new and emerging technologies like digital assets, distributed ledgers, quantum computing, and greater use of artificial intelligence are dominating discussion. We have to remind ourselves that innovation has always been at the heart, too, for financial services. In fact, financial technology, or fintech as we call it, is hardly new. With the advent of the credit card in 1950, the first ATM in 1967, the first electronic securities exchange in 1971, computer-based access to bank accounts in the 80s, and peer-to-peer -peer payments in the 90s, innovation has always been transforming our relationship between consumers, businesses, and their financial service provider and their money. But today we want to talk about how government agencies, while they're not at the forefront of innovation frequently, they definitely can stop innovation dead in its tracks. We recall President Reagan's very fond uh, conversation about what he thinks government thinks of the economy. If it moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. And if it stops moving, subsidize it. And that's the challenge we always have in here in Congress, is making sure that we facilitate innovation, that we work with our regulators to do that. Over the years, Congress has added ombudsmen in agencies just to represent the people that are regulated, to make sure they get a fair shake. We've added cost-benefit analysis through the Administrative Procedures Act to make sure that the rules that are pronounced actually make sense and have some common sense associated with it. And of course, we apply our oversight capability, which we're doing today. So it was only a few years ago that some of your agencies began establishing specific offices dedicated to facilitating responsible innovation. And many of you lead those offices at your respective agencies. This, is the hearing, this hearing is the first time that the committee has called each of you to testify about your agency's work related to innovation. And regret, regrettably, when I look at the Government Accountability Office uh, recent report, uh, maybe some of that progress is lacking. So we'll have a good discussion about that today. Let me recap cap some of the actions taken by President Biden's regulators. The Fed announced a novel activity supervision program in August for enhanced supervision on new activities related to fintech and digital assets. The NCUA established its Office of, office of Financial Technology and Access in January of this year. While the office is engaging with stakeholders and hosting public presentations, it's yet to establish a workforce planning process to ensure the staff have the knowledge and skills necessary to carry out its mission over FinTech. The CFPB's Office of Innovation was founded in 2018 to encourage consumer-friendly innovation, but was replaced in 2022 by the Office of Competition and Innovation, and two of the most innovation-forward policies that had been previously established were discontinued. The OCC, the earliest regulator to establish an innovation office back in 2016, but the office was dissolved into the Office of Financial Technology in March, and the individual who reportedly lied about his extensive industry experience and education was placed at the helm. So maybe we should have some oversight of that too. I look forward to the discussion today, and I yield uh, uh, to the ranking member uh, five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing to explore how financial regulators play an important role in fostering and regulating innovation in the financial services space. I'd like to thank our witnesses for their willingness to share their agency's expertise and their critical work with this committee. Under the Trump administration, several regulators established offices of innovation to purportedly encourage innovation and prevent un unnecessary regulatory barriers. Uh, however, in practice, it became evident that some of these offices were simply a vehicle for lowering regulatory standards. Agencies issued rules that received significant pushback from consumer advocates and were the subject of litigation initiated by state regulators. For example, the CFPB issued a handful of no-action letters that were criticized for protecting individual companies from enforcement action when they broke the law, leading to consumer harm risks. And additionally, the OCC attempted to issue fintech charters, which would have allowed non-bank fintech companies to operate like a bank without being subject to comprehensive uh, deposit of oversight. If we truly value innovation, we should want regulators to police bad actors who are evading laws so that innovative companies playing by the rules can have a level playing field to be profitable while also working in the interests of consumers. I'm encouraged that under the current administration, regulators have transitioned these offices 
of innovation to focus greater attention on market monitoring, competition, and integrating innovation into existing regulatory functions. The CFPB has focused on improving competition and data protection through its data portability rulemaking. The SEC's Strategic Hub for Innovation and FinTech engages in understanding distributed ledger technology and artificial intelligence. I also applaud the ways regulators have explored and cautioned against the risk of digital assets. In January, the Fed, FDIC, OCC, and the OCC issued a joint statement that cautioned banks against involvement in crypto assets, citing heightened liquidity, volatility, and fraud risks. The collapse of FTX and of Silvergate Bank last year, a prominent banking partner for crypto companies, illustrates the need for this type of guidance. Additionally, both the OCC and the FDIC have used their innovation functions to increase scrutiny over bank fintech partnerships and the ways they can lead to regulatory evasion. In October, the Fed issued an enforcement action against Metropolitan Commercial Bank for failing to properly oversee its fintech partner, MovoCash. An investigation found that as early as January 2020, fraud act is openly fraudulent Movo Cash account to root direct deposit and government benefits improperly. More than $300 million were of pandemic unemployment benefits were misdirected to fraud actors. Moreover, innovation does not need to come solely from the private sector, and we should be encouraging government agencies to innovate to improve financial access and opportunity. With 130 countries, which represent 98% of the global GDP, exploring a government-issued central bank digital currency, the U.S. should not risk falling behind. It, it is, I find it ironic that many of my colleagues on this subcommittee want re regulators to encourage innovation, yet are pushing legislation that shuts down a CBDC before agencies have adequately researched and, and explored it. There are countless other services that government can provide in coordination with the private sector to expand financial inclusion, and we should be encouraging this type of exploration. I'm eager to learn more about the ways agencies are encouraging innovation in the, in the financial sector, and I yield back. Chairman yields back. Chair recognizes the chairman of the full committee, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina, for one minute. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Hill, and uh, to each of you, I want to thank you for the task uh, and the important job you've undertaken. Uh, fostering innovation at institutions and firms under your su supervision is vital and important. Since my legislation to modernize and streamline how innovators interact with regulators, many agencies have established offices focused on innovation. That's welcome. It's positive. However, I'm increasingly concerned that those offices, your offices, are not operating as intended. It's critical that firms, financial institutions of all sizes, and entrepreneurs can go to market with innovative products sooner while maintaining important consumer protections. These offices should not be used to smother innovation and technology or simply ignore it. Uh, it's also important we have the highest quality folks in charge of those offices. It's clear the administration cannot continue to only regulate by enforcement, and I encourage each of you uh, to stay focused on your mission and work to provide regulatory certainty for both industry and regulators and consumers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Today we welcome the testimony of Donna Murphy. Ms. Murphy is the Acting Deputy Comptroller for the Office of Financial Technology and Deputy Comptroller for Compliance Risk Policy at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Charles Weiss, Mr. Weiss is Director of Financial Technology and Access at the National Credit Union Administration. Valerie Supanik, Ms. Supanik is the Director of the SEC Strategic Hub for Innovation and Financial Technology. Mr. Michael Gibson, Dr. Gibson is the director of the Federal Reserve Board's Division of Supervision and Regulation at the Board of Governors here at the Federal Reserve System. And Epstein, Ms. Epstein is assistant director for the Office of Competition and NF Innovation at the CFPB. And Mark Francis Mulholland, Mr. Mulholland is deputy chief information officer for management at the FDIC. We thank each of you for taking time to be with us today. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony, and without objection, each of your written statements will be made a part of our record. Ms. Murphy, you're recognized to give uh, your oral remarks for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, Chairman McHenry, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to appear today to discuss the activities and initiatives of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currencies Office of Financial Technology. I am currently serving as the Acting Deputy Comptroller for the Office of Financial Technology, 
in addition to my permanent position as Deputy Comptroller for Compliance Risk Policy. In my acting capacity, I oversee the agency's work relating to the analysis and evaluation of financial technology innovations, trends, emerging risks, and implications for OCC-supervised banks. My team of financial technology policy specialists supports the development of policy guidance, outreach, training, and supervision resources for fintech-related business models, platforms, and applications. Over the years, the OCC has adapted its supervisory approach to address the many technological innovations by OCC-supervised banks and to support responsible innovation in the banking industry. In 2016, the OCC became the first federal banking agency to establish a dedicated Office of Innovation in order to provide a framework for activities related to financial technology innovation. For the last six years, the Office of Innovation has also conducted outreach, such as designated office hours in which stakeholders, including technology firms, banks, trade associations, academics, and consumer groups, interact with the agency. Information gained from this outreach facilitates our supervisory approaches to supporting banks in responsibly innovating through the use of advanced technologies. In October 2022, the OCC announced that it would build upon this work by creating the Office of Financial Technology, which incorporates the former Office of Innovation. The new office is focused on supporting responsible innovation and ensuring high quality guidance and supervision for banks' financial technology implementation. The OCC's current financial technology focus includes matters involving bank fintech partnerships, artificial intelligence, digital assets and tokenization, as well as the other new and changing technologies and business models that affect OCC supervised banks. Banks' relationships with third parties, including fintech companies, continue to expand. The use of third parties has significant potential benefits, but strong third party risk management is essential to avoid harm to consumers or weakening of bank safety and soundness. Earlier this year, the OCC, FDIC, and Federal Reserve published interagency guidance on third-party relationships in risk management. This document reminds banks of their responsibility to operate in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with applicable laws and regulations, regardless of whether their activities are performed in-house or outsourced. The OCC also recognizes the considerable and growing interest by the banking industry in a wide range of uses for artificial intelligence. When used appropriately, AI applications such as chatbots, enhanced credit screening, and fraud detection systems have the potential to strengthen safety and soundness, improve banks' ability to address financial crime, and increase access to the banking sector for consumers. Banks also are exploring newly developed kinds of AI, such as generative AI, which can be used to generate text, images, or other outputs from a given prompt. OCC supervised institutions are approaching generative AI with caution, and its use is not widespread in the federal banking system. For all uses of AI in the banking sector, the OCC remains focused on the potential risks of adverse outcomes if bank use of AI is not properly managed and controlled. We continue to perform robust risk-based supervision, monitor the industry, and conduct research to ensure that the agency keeps pace with financial sector changes. In addition, the OCC recognizes the potential of other technologies, including distributed ledger technology, and we maintain a careful and cautious approach to their use while industry standards develop and legal and ethical questions are addressed. Overall, however, the financial industry's attention in the digital asset space appears to be shifting to the tokenization of assets and liabilities. Tokenization is driven by solving real-world settlement problems and shows promising potential. In February, the OCC will host a symposium on tokenization to explore its legal foundations, use cases, and risk management and control considerations. My written statement also discusses ways financial technology innovation can be used to increase access to traditional financial services, and it describes some of the OCC's efforts to support this very important objective. In closing, rapid financial technology innovation requires a robust approach by financial regulators. The OCC is committed to helping banks innovate while evolving in a safe, sound, and fair manner. Thank you, and I would be happy to answer questions about the OCC's work to support financial technology. Thank you very much. Mr. Weiss, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the committee, thank you, thank you for inviting me to discuss National Credit Union Administration's efforts to foster financial technology. I'm Charles A. Weiss, Director of the NCUA's Office of Financial Technology and Access. 
I began my career in 1990 with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, serving as an examiner for 18 years. In 2008, I was appointed commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Financial Institutions, a position I held for 14 years before joining the NCUA on January 1st, 2023. During my three decades of experience, I've witnessed the resiliency of the credit union and banking industries in the face of such challenges as Y2K concerns, the Great Recession, natural disasters, and the COVID-19 pandemic. I've seen how technology can be both a benefit and a risk that must be properly managed. On one hand, technology can improve efficiency, facilitate better communication with members, and offer around-the-clock services. On the other hand, technology represents risks that must be managed, monitored, and mitigated. The NCUA understands this fine balance. The NCUA's Office of Financial Technology and Access identifies barriers, challenges, and opportunities credit unions face in adopting and using technology to provide financial services to their members. In 2023, the NCUA board adopted the Financial Innovation Rule, which provides additional flexibility for federally insured credit unions to use advanced technologies and opportunities offered by the financial technology sector. <clears throat> the proposed rule su received supportive comments from the public during the notice and comment period and was finalized in September. In addition, the NCUA is committed to promoting effective and efficient use of, tech of emerging technology. The agency has implemented several initiatives, including a virtual examination program and a digital asset working group. With the virtual examination program, the NCUA is exploring methods to use technology to improve examination and supervision procedures. The NCUA's Digital Asset Working Group is an agency team that develops guidance for the credit union industry's use of distributed ledger technology and offering digital asset and cryptocurrency services to members. The NCUA is also evaluating digital identification technology. The use of digital identification can be a useful tool for verifying identity and a number of states have issued mobile driver's license. Some credit unions have completed successful pilot tests using digital identification and are in the process of updating their policies and procedures to incorporate this technology for onboarding new members. In 2024, ACCESS, which is an acronym for Advancing Communities Through Credit, Education, Stability, and Support, is spearheading an initiative to improve access to financial services in financial deserts. This will highlight opportunities for the agency to assist regions where credit union services are limited or certain segments of the population are underserved. The initiative will also serve, will also identify outreach opportunities, ensuring the NCUA's actions are timely, relevant, and impactful. The ACCESS team will pilot a program to target outreach for three communities in 2024. As part of the pilot, the NCUA will catalog and track the impact of the agency's financial inclusion efforts and identify additional gaps and opportunities to foster financial inclusion. Finally, the NCUA's lack of supervisory authority over credit union service organizations and third-party vendors is a noteworthy vulnerability for the industry. If Congress reauthorizes the NCUA's third-party vendor authority per the NCUA board chair's request, the agency will adopt a program and prioritize examinations based on, it, based on identified risks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the NCUA's efforts to foster financial inc technology and financial inclusion. This concludes my comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Sopanik, you're recognized for five minutes to give your oral presentation. Thank you. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, Chairman McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today about the SEC's Strategic Hub for Innovation in Financial Technology, also known as FinHub. It is my honor to appear before you today to discuss FinHub's work. I'm testifying today in my official capacity as director of FinHub, but my testimony does not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the SEC staff. I'm also pleased to see in attendance those who represent similar functions to mine from among, among the SEC's regulatory partners. I've served at the, as the head of FinHub since it was launched in 2018 and became its director when in 2020 it was designated as a standalone office reporting to the SEC chair. FinHub was designed to be an agile hub and spoke structure, with eight full-time staff at the hub and experts from the agency's divisions and offices um, in order to create a rapid communication and coordination network across the agency and to avoid siloing. In this way, FinHub utilizes and augments the agency's expertise concerning leading-edge technologies and innovations 
that foreshadow the future direction of the financial industry. FinHub helps the agency achieve its mission to protect investors, maintain fair and orderly and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation by helping coordinate the agency's oversight of and responses to emerging financial technologies across numerous areas, including distributed ledger technology and digital assets, automated investment advice, digital marketplace financing, and artificial intelligence. FinHub identifies and analyzes emerging financial technologies, builds and enhances the agency's expertise, and engages with market participants, regulators, and other organizations to advance the SEC's mission. More specifically, FinHub has three major functions. First, we are an external resource. Innovators and other members of the public can seek engagement with the SEC staff through FinHub concerning technology, business models, and regulatory issues. We also conduct active outreach with FinTech communities across the country, participating in outreach events such as conferences, classes, and tech sprints. Our website provides a clearinghouse of information regarding the SEC's activities in FinTech, and we encourage market participants to use the materials on our website as a resource and to reach out to staff if they want to discuss issues. Second, we are an internal resource in that we evaluate the impact of rapidly evolving and often unpredictable technology, and we onboard the knowledge, tools, and data that we need in order to provide subject matter expertise within the agency. FinHub is a dedicated and specialized resource, staffed not only with attorneys, but also with those having expertise in computer science, financial an analysis, and data research and analytics. We invest FinHub's time and resources to cultivate a deep FinTech expertise so that other commission staff can quickly benefit from our input and analyses, allowing them to perform their day-to-day -day work. FinHub is committed to understanding the technologies that impact our markets, and we're taking proactive steps to make sure that the SEC staff has hands-on opportunity to work with new technology. Third, FinHub is a liaison. We actively monitor domestic and international developments related to FinTech, and we have an ongoing engagement, both domestic and foreign, uh, to actively monitor, understand, and respond to emerging issues. FinHub's role is to help the agency strike the right balance between fostering beneficial and responsible innovation in our capital markets on the one hand, and preventing potentially harmful and illicit practices against investors on the other. The goal is to promote and maintain investor confidence and integrity in our markets as the markets incorporate financial innovation. We hope through thoughtful engagement with innovators and others, and through understanding emerging technologies, we strike the right balance. I believe that industry participants and others who take the time and effort to engage with the SEC staff and with the staff of our fellow regulatory agencies will play a critical role in shaping the future of FinTech and assuring that the US capital markets continue to adhere to the high standards that have made them so deep, liquid, fair, and attractive for decades. On a personal note, before I became a lawyer, I earned my degree in engineering. It has been my great privilege to combine my passion for science, the law, and public service in my current role. And I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to serve with extraordinarily de dedicated members of my staff and the staff who work with FinHub from across the commission. These colleagues are fully committed to serving their country and to the agency's mission and are a source of inspiration to me. Thank you, and I look forward to having any question, answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Director Gibson, you're now recognized for five minutes for your oral presentation. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss supervision and regulation as it relates to innovation in the financial system. The Federal Reserve is committed to supporting responsible innovation, both by the firms we oversee directly and in the financial system broadly. We recognize that innovation can reinforce the safety and soundness of banks and the stability of our financial system increase operational efficiencies, and reduce costs. However, innovation can also lead to risks, some of which are familiar and others more novel. The Federal Reserve Board, alongside the other federal bank regulatory agencies, has a statutory responsibility to supervise banks to help ensure they operate in a safe and sound manner and in compliance with all applicable laws. In keeping with that mission, we require the banks we oversee to identify and manage the risks associated with the new technologies they use. Our approach to supervising and regulating innovation in banking is based on the following overarching principles. First, activities that present fundamentally the same risks should be regulated in the same way, regardless of where or how the activity occurs or the terms used to describe the activity. 
Second, the Federal Reserve has not taken and does not take a position on who banks can offer services to, so long as they remain within the confines of the law. Banking organizations are neither prohibited nor discouraged from providing banking services to customers of any specific class or type as permitted by law or regulation. Third, we have sought to be transparent about our expectations and approaches to novel activity, supervision, and regulation to provide a pathway for responsible innovation. Finally, we recognize that we also must continue to learn, which is why we engage in regular outreach. In keeping with these principles, the Federal Reserve recently announced the creation of a novel activities supervision program to focus on the supervision of novel technology-driven activities at banks. These activities include those involving crypto assets, distributed ledger technology, and complex technology-driven bank partnerships with non-bank fintechs, each of which I discuss further in my written testimony. By dedicating a team of supervisory experts to these activities, our aim is to provide clarity as well as timely, consistent, and relevant feedback to the institutions we supervise. The federal bank regulatory agencies have also recently issued guidance on third-party risk management, which lays out the agency's supervisory expectations for all types of third-party relationships, including relationships with financial technology companies. I'd like to pivot now to artificial intelligence, which banks are leveraging for a variety of applications, such as fraud monitoring and customer service. While the technology offers several benefits, it also poses risks, including data challenges, explainability, bias, cybersecurity, and consumer protection. Federal Reserve staff continues to work closely with the other federal bank regulatory agencies to track and learn more about emerging practices regarding banks' use of AI and related risk management. Finally, it is important to note that innovation is not confined to the private sector. The Federal Reserve is focused on finding opportunities to use innovative technology to enhance our supervision of the banking industry. We are evaluating industry-leading technology to determine if adoption of such tools will enhance our supervision technology and increase efficiency. The Federal Reserve is committed to supporting responsible innovation while also working to ensure that any risks associated with novel financial products and services are properly managed. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Epstein. You're now recognized for five minutes for your oral remarks. Good morning, Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Today's hearing is well-timed and critical as innovation is rapidly changing the competitive landscape bringing new opportunities and challenges for consumers and financial services more holistically. A competitive and innovative financial sector is critical for our economy, for our global competitiveness, and to create choice for consumers. Advances in technology can improve our lives when done within a vibrant com competitive marketplace that maximizes consumer choice and safety. The CFPB has significantly ramped up efforts to facilitate market competition to ensure that Consumer financial markets are fair, transparent, and competitive. The Office of Competition and Innovation is part of this broader initiative to monitor for any obstacles to new entrants and to support competition. I oversee this monitoring through conversations with many firms in the fintech ecosystem and through gathering data on new business models. When the CFPB first opened its doors just over a decade ago, technology companies and consumer finance were an emerging trend. They were an anomaly. The world has since evolved. Today, many traditional financial services companies see themselves as technology companies. And large technology companies, many with built-in customers and scale from other business lines, are providing consumer financial services, particularly in the payment space. Newer technologies, such as generative AI, are increasingly being used to market financial products and provide customer service with potentially unexpected outcomes. It is vitally important that we examine what this means for consumers and for the industry. As technology has increased in importance, the CFPB has expanded our own in-house expertise. For example, we've added a chief technologist and developed a technologist program that recruits for technical expertise in areas such as data science, AI, and UX design, and embeds this expertise throughout the CFPB. The CFPB is also playing a role in setting up new rules of the road in this landscape to ensure that the future state of financial services is open to innovation. In October, the CFPB published a proposal for the Personal Financial Data Rights Rule, 
as required under Section 1033 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act. We believe this rule, which would create new standards that facilitate sharing consumer financial data, will create an environment in which new entrants can thrive while simultaneously allowing consumers greater control and choice. We've also focused on ensuring that newer technologies are used in ways that comply with existing laws. For example, if AI is used in loan underwriting, it must conform with existing rules that require lenders to provide consumers with adverse action notices that explain reasons for loan denial. Without transparency, consumers cannot effectively protect their rights and understand the reasons why they may have been declined for credit. The requirement also plays a vital role in helping to detect and deter illegal discrimination. We also work to encourage the development of innovative new technology products and services that will provide real value to consumers. My office is running a tech sprint where private companies use data to build technology products. In this case, to help consumers make more informed credit card choices. Tech sprints are a tool used by the CFPB to foster the creation of private tools and to get feedback from external parties. Two weeks ago, we announced that CFPB would be working with the independent Community Bankers of America to test adjustments to mortgage disclosures in the unique context of construction loans. This has potential benefits across the housing market, and in particular to Americans living in rural areas where existing housing stock is often in scarce supply and new homes are seldom built on spec, but rather require upfront capital from the borrower. Construction loan disclosures have historically been more oriented toward the purchase of existing homes that do not require significant fund for renovation. My office approved a proposal from the ICBA that will allow lenders to apply to do in-market testing of these new disclosures. This is the first application under the, uh, tri the trial disclosure policy and a great illustration of how we can work together with industry to identify and address real market needs supporting American families and communities. Finally, I'd like to highlight the importance of collaboration and consistency across the regulatory framework. My office chairs an organization called the American Consumer Financial Innovation Network, where we meet regularly with states on innovation topics. We're also we are also a coordinating group member of the Global Financial Innovation Network, along with most of the other regulators on this panel. We're able to share approaches to similar challenges with regulators across the globe. In summary, my office and the CFPB as a whole is focused on advancing a more sophisticated approach to competition and innovation in support of our statutory mission to ensure the market for consumer financial services is fair, transparent, and competitive. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Mulholland, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Hill, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to appear before you today at the hearing on fo fostering financial innovation, how agencies can leverage technology to shape the future of financial services. My name is Mark Mulholland, and I'm the Deputy CIO for Management at the FDIC. I've worked for the federal government for more than 34 years, having started with the General Services Administration in 1989. In 1996, I began working for the FDIC's Office of Inspector General, where I performed audits of FDIC's programs and operations, with a particular emphasis on information technology and security. In August of 2021, I transferred to the FDIC's Chief Information Officer Organization, or CIOO. In my current role, I oversee the CIOO's budget and financial operations, procurement and contract management activities, internal review and risk management programs, and human resources management. The FDIC relies heavily on technology to carry out its core mission of maintaining stability and public confidence in our nation's financial system. In 2023, the FDIC budgeted almost $500 million to support the development, enhancement, modernization, and maintenance of its IT infrastructure systems and data. IT modernization is a top priority at the FDIC. The FDIC is currently implementing a multi-year IT modernization program to bring its IT environment into alignment with modern IT practices and standards, as well as with key federal priorities, including the federal cloud smart strategy. Under the IT modernization program, the CIOO is working to migrate and modernize its systems and data from legacy on-premise data centers to cloud technology platforms that offer enhanced IT capabilities, security, and resiliency. The IT modernization program includes an objective to modernize our risk management supervision and compliance examination business processes and systems. In June of this year, the FDIC began operating the first major supervisory application that supports consumer compliance and Community Reinvestment Act examinations in the cloud. The CIOO is also partnering with the FDIC's Division of Risk Management Supervision 
on a new multi-year effort to modernize the FDIC's core risk management related systems using cloud solutions. I also want to mention FDI Tech, a key component within the CIO organization. FDI Tech focuses on the adoption of innovative technologies within the FDIC itself. For example, FDI Tech is partnering with the Division of Risk Management Supervision to expand the use of machine learning to analyze reports of examination and other information of individual institutions to identify risks across the banking sector. FDI Tech is also evaluating the benefits, risks, and potential applications of distributed ledger technology both at the FDIC and in the banking sector. Finally, the FDIC recognizes that financial technology innovation in the banking sector offers a number of important and potential benefits, such as enhanced operations, reduced costs, improved delivery of services, and greater financial inclusion through expanded access to credit and other banking services. At the same time, technology innovation presents risks that financial institutions must effectively manage, such as consumer protection, privacy, and data risks. To ensure the FDIC understands the benefits of financial technology innovation and is prepared to address the associated risks, the FDIC routinely engages with industry stakeholders through a number of channels. For example, the FDIC issues periodic requests for information about innovative technologies, reviews the use of technology in individual banks and select service providers through the examination process, and discusses technology issues with bankers through such forums as the FDIC Advisory Committee on Community Banking. The FDIC has also established various internal committees, working groups, and component organizations within the FDIC that focus on financial technologies. Collectively, these activities help to inform the FDIC's supervisory strategies and regulatory policy making. That concludes my opening statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll now turn to member questions. I recognize myself for five minutes. I thought, Ms. Epstein, you referenced uh, the Global Innovation Network, and uh, Ms. Suponik, you talked about sort of coordination responsibilities over at the Commission. So uh, do the six of your offices get together on a regular basis, not to talk about global comparisons internationally and host a big meeting with a nice dinner, but do your staff meet on a regular basis about common innovation issues? Give me a yes or or who, who, who wants to answer that question is going to speak up for the group or try to? So you don't? I can start. Okay. Um, our offices and other parts of our agencies uh, meet on a regular basis. With a bias the... towards seeing how we can advance innovation. With, with a discussion of how we can advance innovation, what risks we're seeing, what use cases we're seeing in the industry. Um, on both an internal basis uh, and an external basis within. And so, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Gibson does, or Dr. Director Gibson, does the, uh, any exam preferences that you find from your innovation office, do those get coordinated through the, through FIFIAC so that there's one approach to examining on these topics? We, we share a lot of information through FIFIAC on examination procedures. On these particular topics, I would say this sharing is more from the staff who are specialists in innovation. Mm -hmm. So we've issued, you've issued uh, this uh, novel activity supervision rule. And I'm curious, uh, does, how do you see that fostering innovation, Mr. Uh, Director Gibson? So we did establish a novel activities supervision program earlier this year, and the goal is really to make sure that our uh, examiners who are engaging with firms that are doing these innovative activities have the expertise and the training in order to effectively supervise them, uh, understand both the benefits that the firms are seeking with the innovative technologies and that the firms yep. are managing the risks. So, Mr. Weiss, you've been a bank examiner a long time. You've seen the, the good news and bad news out in bank examination out in the real world. Some, some of your colleagues here maybe have not had that great experience. And then Kentucky Commissioner. Uh, don't you think boards of directors uh, have, under the CAMELS examination process, don't they have the responsibility for all the things that are in the novel activity rule to justify you know, a third-party agreement to have somebody do a website or to solicit mortgage applications through an app. Aren't we, don't we already have that? Is the novel activities rule really that needed? Don't you think boards have that responsibility? The, the board would be responsible for the operation of the bank. And they're supposed to con, you know, convince their supervisor that they have the right capital plan for that, the right budget, and the right skills and abilities, right? I think it's incumbent upon the agency, though, to make sure that we have the knowledgeable st staff that's knowledgeable 
an experience to go in and Yeah, do. I think the agency, I mean, I think the agencies have all done a good job over the last 25 years training their own staff to come in and do an IT internal external penetration testing and and look at due diligence files for fintech. Uh, that's been a big improvement by the agencies. I just am I'm very concerned that this rule without real clarity is going to create more confusion and the idea of pre-authorizing to take on a task when it's not material to the bank, for example, in the judgment of the board, I think uh, that could be overkill. Director Gibson, could that create confusion and bog people down if it's not done right? Uh, I think that there's always that potential, but we definitely want to send skilled examiners to engage with boards of directors and bank management so they can have a good dialogue. On the third-party risk management uh, questions, I uh, thought that was um, uh, good that you're meeting together and working together on that as a group. Uh, but I'm hearing anecdotally from uh, community banks particularly that they're receiving substantially more exam questions this year than they did in previous years. Director Gitson, have you heard that from your examiner, field examiners, that banks, uh, bank comments from that vein? Uh, what we've heard is that given all the turmoil in the banking industry this year and the heightened risks that we're definitely focusing on those risks and those conversations uh, have been taking place. Uh, you say on page seven of your guidance that agencies will develop additional resources to assist smaller, non-complex community banks to manage third-party risk. When are those resources going to be published? Our, our staff are working on that, and we hope to publish something soon, similar to what we've done with other recent rules or guidance. So we put out a rule and we make people responsible for it, but we don't give them the guidance on how to comply with it first. Is that how I should read that? Well, we're, we're definitely engaging with firms as the guidance has come out, and we do hope to provide additional resources very soon. Good. I yield back the balance of my time. Turn to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, uh, thank you all for your service. Really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your guidance. Uh, there's a dichotomy in in uh, in the fintech world, uh, and I, I suppose that applies to crypto as well. Uh, you know, in finance, our institutions, our banks are guided by, you know, we we've, we've got a rule-based system, right? Uh, a lot of our financial statutes. Uh, our, our regulatory regimes come out of disasters. Uh, you know, the SEC, uh, you know, the FDIC, Mr. Mulholland, we had thousands of bank failures, created your agency. Uh, Ms. Sabanek, uh, yours as well. Uh, you know, the, the Fed itself created after the panic of 1907. So we have experiences of disaster, financial disasters, and then we have responding statutory language to, to try to correct that. Um, and it created every single one of your agencies, those, those experiences. On the tech side, however, on the tech side, you know, the motto for, for Zuckerberg at Facebook was move fast and break things. That's not a good approach for a bank. So you have this clash of cultures one is rule-based, the other one is move fast and break things. And, and that is playing out in, in the fintech world. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a decision at some point of how, how do we blend those two cultures in a way that protects consumers and depositors and investors, yet allows us to adopt all of this innovation. So, uh, Mr. Gordon, uh, you know, you've got this new office of... Uh, what is it called? Um, I'm blanking on your... Uh, um, the, the novel activities? Novel act yeah, yeah, I was looking for that. Novel activities supervision program, <clears throat> which aims to better supervise banks that are engaging in novel activities. So how, how are you uh, evaluating the risks? Uh, you know, we've seen some notable disasters. FTX uh, was a complete collapse. Thankfully, 90-something percent of the, of the investors were non-U.S. citizens because they had to operate offshore. And so that was a success for our regulatory uh, framework, I think. But uh, how, how are we dealing with some of these risks, and how are we, uh, we evaluating those in real time? So when banks are dealing with 
either complex fintech partnerships or with crypto assets, some of these new areas that pose novel risks. Uh, you know, as I said, there's definitely some benefits to that innovation that we can see, but there's also risks. Now we're definitely seeing some of those risks materialize with some of the complex uh, arrangements that banks are making with some of these fintech companies. And sometimes that has, in some cases, obscured the risk to the bank because the fintech partner has the information about the end customer that the bank lacks. And in some cases, we've seen risks such as BSA AML risk have materialized when banks didn't have uh, strong information on their customers. So that's just one example of the risks that have materialized. We, we do have a, uh, a fair number of uh, uh, criminal activities that are that are favoring cryptocurrency, for example. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, these hacks um, by criminal operations that seek to be paid in, in, in cryptocurrency. That seems to be a, a, a favorite uh, uh, use of, of, of that technology. Is that, uh, is that guiding at all your, your, your approach to this? So banks themselves aren't uh, holding those crypto assets, but banks have been dealing with crypto-related companies, and we have seen risks such as liquidity risk. Uh, we've seen the deposits from those crypto-related companies have been unpredictable, and that's caused some risks to banking organizations. Yeah. So explain to me how, how this, this office, uh, this program, uh, evaluates the technology itself, the architecture, uh, you know, and, and the, is that exploration helpful given the fact that there are, I think, 130 countries out there that are exploring a CBDC right now? So our examiners are going to be focused on the bank's evaluation of the technology and whether the risks are well understood and managed. So we're less in the details of the technology as bank examiners. We're more ensuring compliance with the laws and regulations. I see. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Lucas of Oklahoma is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Panic, as you know, the SEC recently proposed a rule regarding the use of predictive data analytics used by broker dealers and investment advisors. Many respondents are concerned that the proposed rule is overly broad in what is considered a covered technology. I quoted the rule's definition to Chairman Gensler during his appearance before this committee. A covered technology is defined as an analytical technology or computational function, an algorithm, model, correlation matrix, or similar method or process that optimizes, predicts, guides, forecasts, or directs investment behaviors and outcomes. Could you discuss what your office's role was in crafting this? What role you played? Sure, thank you. Uh, what the FinHub does is, is act as a subject matter expert across the commission as the commission staff engages in various activities like rulemaking or examination, policy making or enforcement uh, for, as examples. So for any particular rulemaking, um, the staff who are working on the rule may come to the FinHub uh, staff and ask us, how do particular things work? What is under the hood of this technology. So often we find ourselves analyzing a, cer a certain blockchain, a smart contract, um, artificial intelligence, and how applications work and what those risks are. And so we provide that subject matter expertise, ex expertise to the people working on the rulemaking. In your testimony, uh, you described the necessary balance between fostering innovation and preventing harm. Can you discuss the potential negative consequences if the financial regulators or the SEC in particular, upset this balance by being hostile, so to speak, to certain kinds of technology? Sure. The, I, I think the, the agency's approach and many of the approaches probably of the folks here at the table is to, is to get the right balance. We, we can't have innovation happen at the expense of investors or of market integrity. And so offices like the FinHub encourage people to come in and speak with us about how the federal securities laws apply, for example. We don't give interpretations or legal advice, but we can talk to them about risks that we see or ask questions or answer their questions about their projects. So in that way, through that engagement, we hope to provide a little bit of a platform for public and private engagement to uh, 
to reach a level playing field, I think, where people understand this is what the innovation is trying to achieve, but the regu regulatory agencies have missions and have very important public policy objectives to, to maintain. Mr. Gibson, you outlined in your testimony how banks can benefit from gen generative AI along with the associated risk. Could you discuss how your office coordinates with other bank regulating agencies on AI and machine learning practices, including how your office engages with agencies with technological expertise, such as NIST? So uh, we do engage with other regulators and other agencies. And with respect to NIST, they put out a lot of standards uh, on technology that are very useful and they tend to apply across the entire economy, and we tend to focus on the financial sector. So a lot of times we're taking NIST standards and seeing how do those apply in the banking industry. Speaking of NIST, in preparing for this uh, hearing, I was fascinated to come across a fact that in 1920, NIST conducted extensive research on the design and construction of your Federal Reserve bank vaults, including the gold vaults in the New York City. I just found that to be fascinating a century ago that we were engaged in that. And just an example of when we bring experts from across the government together to address complex challenges, the results really do stand the test of time. Uh, I'd like to also focus and shift a bit on CFPB's approach to emerging technology. Uh, Ms. Epstein, could you identify some of the actions taken by CFPB's Office of Competition and Innovation that have encouraged, let's look at the positive side, that have encouraged companies to innovate? Sure, um, I had used, for example, a specific example in my testimony related to a tech sprint. Um, this is our fourth tech sprint that we are doing um, uh, today. Um, this particular tech sprint is engaging with market participants to bring data that we have related to um, credit card terms and conditions uh, to more encourage better consumer shopping. We know that we are not, as a federal regulator, in the greatest position to bring that data to consumers, and so we're engaging with the private marketplace to help them to identify for them what you know what market innovations could come from this particular data that we are putting out. Um, it also uh, helps us because it gives us feedback as to how our data and our technology that we use to produce this data is useful or not useful. Is it the right latency? Is it um, those kinds of things? So that's one example. Um, we, this is our fourth tech sprint, so we have done this uh, on other occasions for other types of tech sprints as well. My time has um, expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sherman is recognized for five minutes. I Thank you. Dr. Foster will be the way he's disappeared. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Gibson, one of the uh, functions of the Fed is to oversee the ACH system by which we b wire money from one account to another. And the greatest fear that you come up with whenever you're dealing with a buying or selling of a home is that the buyer will be tricked into sending the money to the wrong account. Um, people send an email to somebody, they've got, in effect, their, their, their prospect of ever owning a home is on the line. They've got their down payment, and they get an email saying, send the money to account number one, two, three, four, five, and it's signed by their escrow agent. And of course, it's phony, and the money ends in, uh, up in the hands of a Nigerian prince. Um, for about a decade, or the better part of a decade, I've been asking chairs of the Federal Reserve in this room to do what Britain did quite some time ago, and that's have payee matching, so that when you send the money to an account, it also has a name. Um, that would pretty much eliminate this practice. For the better part of a decade, the chairs of the Fed have said, well, we're not going to do that, but we're doing something else that would solve the problem. And then I ask them what, and they smile and walk away. When are we going to solve this problem so that when you wire money to account one, two, three, four, five, that's supposed to be going to uh, Encino escrow, uh, you're not tricked into using the wrong number? 
So I, I agree that sort of fraud is a problem and... Uh, so why don't we have a pay matching system? Why don't we have a system when you wire the money, it's to a person as well as an account. When I write a check, I put the name of the payee on the check. I don't just write in a number. So since this is, I mean, we're, I know we're dealing with high technology here. This is something we could have done last century. Why don't we have payee matching? So... Uh, I don't have the answer on the specific question. Okay, well, neither has the last five times I've asked this question over the better part of this decade. Can you get me an answer? Yeah, I'm happy to work with you on that. Have you done any calculation as to how much harm is done by the present system versus the costs of doing what the UK has done and have pay e-matching? In Generally, in the area of fraud, we see a lot of fraud taking place and a lot of risk and banks putting a lot of So why don't you do something about it? Well, we're happy, we're happy to work with you on that specific issue. And on I would believe fraud. you if your predecessor's predecessor, if, if Fed officials hadn't been telling me that for the last 10 years and then not doing anything. And they're working on it consists of telling me, oh, well, we know the problem, but uh, we'll get back to you. Um, let's, let's talk about this every week. Look forward to your call next week and every week until we solve this problem. This is just crazy. Um, now, let, I want to turn to the bank regulators. If you make an unsecured loan to an individual, you evaluate that in one way as a uh, bank asset. Another way, if it's a loan secured by valuable assets, such as uh, Fortune 500 uh, stock. Uh, if a loan is secured by crypto, is that viewed as an unsecured loan or is that security regarded as valuable? I'll ask uh, Ms. Murphy. So uh, in that kind of circumstance that you described, we would have to look at the specifics of the loan. Um, there is very, very limited activity uh, of that type in the national banking system. You're saying banks do not make loans secured by crypto accounts? So in order to engage in that type of activity, our banks would have to engage with their examiners, and there's very, very limited activity. What do your examiners do? Do they value it as a fully secured loan or a completely unsecured loan if it's secured by uh, Bitcoin or hamster coin? So or, or, or do you just not know? I, I am not aware of a specific instance where we have valued loans in that way, and I would have to get back to you about that. Uh, please uh, uh, do get back to me. Um, Certainly. Likewise, I'll ask the same question of Mr. Mulholland, and I'll, I'll also ask... Uh, whether uh, any of the FDIC insurance banks hold crypto as an asset on their balance sheet that you give them credit for. Thank you for the, thank you for the question, Chair, uh, Congressman. Uh, the FDIC and the other regulators have issued guidance with respect to holding uh, as principal crypto assets um, and using those as a um, you know, uh, principal for, um, for lending activities and, and cautionary language. Do you give? Do you list it as an asset uh, based on its supposed value today? Or? So I'm, I'm actually working in the, the CIO organization, so I'm not on the supervision. So you also don't know the answer. But I'd be but, happy to get back okay. with you. Um, Thank you. Gentleman Yields. Uh, the gentleman who wants very badly for Army to beat Navy this weekend, <laughs> the vice chairman of our subcommittee, Mr. Davidson of Ohio, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for our witnesses for being here today. Mr. Gibson, I did a quick Google search for open jobs at the Federal Reserve, and the regional banks are using, uh, using the keyword CBDC, or, or key acronym. Uh, it looks like the San Francisco Fed and the Boston Fed are hiring for CBDC development roles, programmers. Uh, can you provide an update for the panel on the Federal Reserve's development of a United States central bank digital currency? So the Federal Reserve is doing research on CBDC technologies, trying to understand uh, the technologies themselves and how they might be useful. Uh, it's research and experimentation at this point, uh, and it's not, uh, not an implementation of a CBDC. So you, you hire people that write code, it starts seeming like you're developing and building versus researching. Um, What's the nature of the research? We're going to build it and test it, test fire it, and see how it works? Uh, I think the research is to understand the technology, understand the different uh, approaches that uh, people are talking about, understand the risks, 
uh, it is a research effort. Like a near implementation, but we'll run it for a while and see if it really works, or are, are you building something that would be functional, or is it, uh, is it just research? So we're a long way off from thinking about implementation of anything related to a CBDC. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gibson, I sent a letter to Chairman Powell regarding Custodia Bank's denial of a master account uh, for, and I quote, quote, Custodia Bank proposed to engage in novel and untested crypto activities that include issuing crypto assets on an open public and or decentralized network, end quote. Shortly after this denial, the Fed created what has been re referenced several times now, the Novel Activities Supervision Program to focus on digital assets, projects using distributed ledger technology, and bank fintech partnerships. This program started in August, and I'm curious if you could give us an update on the activities there. I will say, I'd also like to know, how's the discovery process going? Because I took the rare step of joining an amicus brief of a company because technically Custodia met every element of the stated requirement for a master account, and they even promised to hold 108% of the assets on the books. So they weren't lending against the assets, they simply wanted to provide custody for the assets, not thus the name Custodia. So have you done any work to figure out how there's risk involved in a, essentially a trust company holding with reserves beyond the value of the assets? Have you solved it? So, so uh, I mean, in terms of firms that we are actually supervising, we are definitely looking at the risks of their activities. But you've chosen not to supervise the ones that are actually working in FinTech. Essentially, you've said, it's a big club and you're not in it. Don't ask again. If, if you're asking about the Custodia application, the board did evaluate that application against the statutory factors and uh, the board's order on Custodia is public, so the order explains the findings on the statutory factors. It, it's similar, OCC made progress, Anchorage is in, uh, but nobody else. It's essentially, it's a club, you're not in. Uh, have you solved this riddle as to how somebody could provide custody for an asset? Not lending against it, just custody. Has anyone figured this out? Because the market has, but the regulators haven't. Um, if that's a question for me, I would say that uh, we have been looking at this issue. Obviously, we do have one bank that has been chartered with that as a primary uh, business model. And one of the things that's challenging in that area is compliance with the anti-money laundering laws and regulations, and, and there's a lot of progress being made there through financial technology uh, innovations. Well, it seems that it would be progress. easier to track something that's on a public blockchain than on something that's moving through SWIFT accounts. This is sim similar kind of instructions, uh, and so I, the market really understands this. I'm disappointed that the regulators have essentially decided in choke point 2.0, 3.0, 20.0, .0, whatever, but basically uh, you guys aren't playing. I am curious about the FDIC's approach to third-party risk management. Mr. Mulholland, you talked about it in your opening remarks uh, and in one question, but how are traditional financial institutions' third-party risk management processes being examined, particularly with respect to FinTech, and is there any difference between um, normal activities and FinTech partnerships? Thank you for the question, Congressman. Uh, yes, I did mention the uh, third-party guidance and also due diligence guidance that's been issued by the regulatory agencies to help assist banks in uh, doing uh, selection for third parties such as fintechs, as well as the ongoing monitoring to ensure that- Yeah, my time's expired and I apologize for leaving you too little to respond, but I uh, would love to follow up with you on that. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. If you respond to the gentleman's uh, question in writing, that'd be very helpful to him. We turn to Mr. Kasten of Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Hill, and uh, to all our staff, our uh, witnesses here today. Um, Ms. Saponic, I, I, I hope you'll humor me. I want to get kind of nerdy here, um, and hopefully don't go too far in the weeds. There was re some reporting, I think Chair Gensler last July had indicated that he that the SEC should consider use of AI for, for compliance and regulation. And in September, chair, the chairs testified to the Senate that the SEC um, is using AI models to, to do market surveillance. And I'm wondering if you could just speak briefly to what the how the SEC is using AI right now, and, and specifically how you're, how you're sort of training data sets on AI, um, to think about that briefly, because I, I want to dig into some other points. Sure, and th there is some materials on our website, at FinHub's website, talking about 
how the commission uh, staff has used AI in the past, and typically things like uh, natural language processing and, and machine learning to analyze data sets and market data and other data to, for example, flag aberrations or trends um, to inform what the commission staff is doing across the board. Um, I, I will note that there is uh, pending uh, guidance that we are awaiting from OMB that will come out to give guidance to the agencies throughout the government about the internal use of AI. So we will be monitoring the progress of that guidance and incorporating that going forward. And, and are, you, is, are you making public what data sets you're using to train the AI? Uh, to my knowledge, that is not public, but I can okay. follow up with you. Okay, I don't, and I don't, it's not a leading question. I don't know if it should be or not, but I, I ask because there has been some reporting of, of private sector actors who are now using AI to do it. I think there's a um, uh, risk thinking AI and Bloomberg that are putting this model sort of in anticipation of some climate disclosure rules, looking at big data sets. And what I'm wondering, and I'm not expecting you to comment on the climate disclosure rules right now, but to the extent those models are using the same data sets that your models are using, that would seem to be mutually beneficial for compliance. To the extent they're different, it would seem to create headaches. And I'm just wondering how you all are thinking through that. Sure, what I, what I can say is that in FinHub, we typically try to bring the people in who are producing new types of technology so that we understand how it's being used, what it's capable of, how our registrant population may use it, how investors might use it, or in, and how fraudsters might use it. And so that is the type of outreach and learning we're going through now with respect to this new gen, generative um, AI. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, our internal use will be guided by future guidance and we'll be um, monitoring and evaluating that guidance going forward. Okay. Um, I mean, my, I, I, raised the, I raised the climate piece, number one, because I'm a broken record on climate. Um, but. But also because it strikes me that if we if we think about this as being looking for market manipulation, people things people normally think the SEC does. I suppose that data is not to oversimplify available to anybody who's got a Bloomberg terminal and can pull good data. But as we get to responsibilities, you have to have companies accurately reporting risks and using other public databases. There's this whole rich ethical conversation we're having about who is vetting the databases, and is there a single database, and who's preparing those, and who's making sure the data is good. Yeah, and that's um, something our chair is, is keenly focused on, as he's talked about. Um, he believes that this technology is transformative, but also carries with it some risks, and that, <clears throat> as you mentioned, have to do with bias, explainability, how robust is the model, um, how can it be used to deceive, is it being used in a way that's creating conflicts of interest. So these are all things that the staff is really going to be focused okay. on, and, and me as uh, the director of FinHub. Yeah, and rich conversation about the ethics. I'm, I'm focused on the data sets, sure. just because that starts to, you can run different models on the same data set, and hopefully if the models are good, get consistent answers, but if the data sets are different, it's conflict. Just last thing on that point. Um, the chair has warned of financial institutions and said that they're going to rely on a limited number of AI platforms, but I think has been fairly open and I think very thoughtful about saying that if if your your regulation is at the level of a given entity, but if those entities are now relying on, you know, a single set of cross cross company platforms, <clears throat> if the problem is with that platform, do you all have the tools to assess these questions? Do you need help from Congress? How are how are you thinking about this question if there is data set integrity from ethics or otherwise and it's and it spans a lot of different companies. And I think you've identified one of the issues that the chair has raised about micro concerns and macro concerns. And so this uh, macro concern about concentrations and what can happen if everyone's using the same data set or if there's herding behavior, that is something that the staff will be looking at closely as well. Okay, so I, I hear the tapping that I'm out of time. Um, you'll the gentleman's back. time hasn't follow up. Thank you, you'll back. Chair recognizes the majority whip of the House, Mr. Emmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today. When Bill Hinman was the director of the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance, he gave a speech on June 14, 2018, entitled Digital Transactions When Howie Met Gary. In this speech, he famously discussed how tokens can morph from securities to non-securities and he stated that Ether 
is not a security. Ms. Panic, you reviewed and commented on drafts of this speech, didn't you? Yes, I did. When reviewing a draft, you said that providing, quote, less detail in the speech was better because the concept of a token morphing from a security to a non-security was a new concept and would generate a lot of discussion. Do I have that correct? I believe so. So you thought the SEC should give less clarity to the market rather than more. I understand you thought the uh, token morphing concept would generate a lot of discussion, but when the industry complains about a lack of clarity, I see it was a deliberate policy preference. Does the current SEC chair share that view? So I, I can't really testify about the current chair's view. What I can say is that um, the, the determination whether any particular asset is a security is a facts and circumstances based determination. And what I do as the director of FinHub with my staff is to provide the facts to the folks at the SEC who are making that determination. And it's typically going to be the division of corporation finance. Uh, reclaiming my time because that's a perfect segue. Uh, has FinHub issued any guidance since Chair Gensler took office to clarify how the securities laws apply to crypto? So as I mentioned, FinHub's role is really to be a subject matter expert. So we Reclaiming my time, ma'am. I'm asking a very specific question. Has FinHub issued any guidance? FinHub typically gets involved with other divisions and uh, divisions and offices at the agency who are issuing statements. Reclaiming and my time, I, uh, I take the answer is no, because it is no. It seems to be uh, enforcement through uh, or uh, rulemaking through enforcement action. Uh, in his speech, Hinman announced that Ether was not a security, is not a security. Is that your view today? I can't comment on a particular asset. Right. Well, just to back up for a second, you provided feedback on the speech and so did Brett Redfern, who was then the director of the SEC's Division of Trading and Markets. Yet first the SEC argued in court that the speech was Hinman's own personal opinion. Then the SEC argued that the speech was the opinion of only the Division of Corporation Finance, which Hinman led. But why would people across the SEC, from FinHub to the Division of Trading and Markets, comment on a speech that has the views of only one person or only one div division? That doesn't make any sense. I hope you can appreciate that I can't comment on pending matters that are in litigation or investigation. Okay, fair enough. The Southern District of New York even called the SEC's arguments hypocrisy. That the SEC would argue that the speech is not relevant to the market's understanding of how the SEC will regulate crypto. While it's a fact that Hinman obtained legal advice from SEC counsel in drafting his speech. The court said SEC is adopting its litigation positions to further its desired goal and not out of faithful allegiance to the law. That is what all of us in Congress have seen. The SEC is not adhering to the law. That's why it keeps losing in court. Does the chairman of the SEC tell you to, to adopt positions to further a specific goal, his own personal goal, rather than allegiance to the law? Again, I, I can't comment on any matters that are pending in litigation, but I will say that I, I, I do appreciate it. I, I, I reclaim my time. I think you answered the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman uh, from Illinois, Dr. Foster is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hill, for hosting this hearing and to our witnesses for joining us today. Our emerging technologies like artificial intelligence present new opportunities to make our financial system more secure, inclusive, and efficient. They also present new risks if not, that, if not mitigated, can be a threat to consumers and the U.S. economy. One of the most immediate of those threats are that deep fakes created with generative AI models can mimic an individual's appearance or voice. This makes scammers much more convincing and makes it harder for financial institutions to verify the identities of their customers. Now, countries like India, Estonia, Korea, there's a long list, have taken national steps to provide citizens who wish with a secure form of digital identification that can be presented online. A secure digital ID, biometrically synced to your smartphone, allows individuals to remotely verify that they are who they say they are, saving costs, reducing likelihood of fraud, and to allow individuals to defend themselves against deepfake identity fraud. 
Now, Mr. Vice, in your testimony, you mentioned that NCUA is evaluating digital ID technology and that, in fact, some credit unions have completed successful pilot tests of this technology. Uh, could you describe the experience of the credit unions uh, that you referenced? Uh, for example, were the credit unions able to streamline the process of onboarding new members? Um, and again, I'd be uh, reporting what they've reported to me, but it gives them a secure method to identify and certify someone's identification, and it reduces the time to onboard. Yep. So if this, for example, if this was in place uh, during COVID when we had to onboard massive numbers of unbanked customers, and, but the customers had had a secure digital ID, um, would, would that have been a, a, a big improvement in our response to COVID? Uh, one of the things that I was very amazed with during the COVID period of how advanced technology had to become to be able to offer financial services to individuals. So as long as the tool is used properly, it could have been a help. Mm -hmm. um, now, the mobile ID rollout in the United States has been fragmented. Uh, with some states moving much faster than others to adopt the technology. Have you identified any barriers that are keeping states from adopting this technology? And do you see a use in national standards uh, to, to promote this? That would be a state decision that uh, the NCUA wouldn't be involved with, um, but definitely pointing to NIST and the standards have been established by NIST on the di digital identification. Yeah. Do any of our other witnesses have any comments on this area, the utility of a, of a national standards for a secure digital ID provided by states? No one's jumping for the microphone? Okay. Uh, Ms. Epstein, several states, including Arizona, Colorado, Maryland, and Georgia, currently issue mobile IDs attached to their smartphone. Um, has the CFPB received any requests from financial institutions regarding the use of the mobile ID for identity verification in consumer finance? I'm not aware of um, any particular requests. Okay, and then do you believe that a secure digital ID might protect consumers and save them time when addressing areas, you know, such as consumer online transactions and so on? You know, I think um, we have certainly seen in our consumer complaint database and, and other forms that um, scammers and, and other types of um, identity theft continue to be issues um, throughout. So um, to the extent that that would be helpful, um, okay. but I don't have any particular... Specific things. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vice, uh, the NCUA has long advocated for restoration of its statutory authority over third-party vendors. Uh, providing services to federal insured credit unions. Uh, we've been, uh, our office has been trying to get uh, some action on this for a, for a long time and uh, with, uh, with uh, limited success. Uh, but just a few days ago, um, what we worried about has actually happened. Uh, roughly 60 credit unions experienced outages when a shared third party vendor was hacked by cyber criminals. Um, and uh, you, because of Congress in action on this. We don't, you don't have the authority you need to make sure the cyber hygiene was what it should be. Um, does the NCUA have a regulatory blind spot uh, that you cannot oversee these 30 party, third party vendors and, and what can we in Congress do to help? Yes, it definitely has a regulatory blind spot. Our chairman has asked for this authority. Um, the GAO has also recommended that the NCUA should have it as long as, as in addition to our own um, AAG. Or, I'm sorry, IG, Inspector General. And um, one of the things that was talked about at the very beginning of this is do we coordinate and do we, do we coordinate with each other? And because we don't have that third party vendor authority, in many instances when things come up, we don't have a seat at that table because of the lack of authority. Thank you, my time's up, yield back. Gentleman yields, <coughs> gentleman yields back. A gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hill, and thank you, uh, uh, Rep Ranking Member Lynch uh, for holding this important hearing today, and I want to take this opportunity to wish Chairman Hill a happy birthday. Uh, Mr. Vice, the uh, NCUA established the Office of Financial Technology and Access earlier this year, um, which you lead. While your office is still relatively new, can you speak about what you've done over the past year and what your office hopes to accomplish within the next year? From a big picture perspective, I think one of the, some of the things we've talked about already are very important, and that is a, there is a balance between the use of technology, technology is a tool, how it's used, 
Um, is it used in a positive manner? Is it used to enhance member um, experience um, and service and offering fair and equitable service? But there's also some risk associated with it. So we want to take a look at both those balance of what technology needs to be adopted, having a lot of conversations with not only the credit union industry, but also the technology industry as well, and then making sure that's balanced to make sure that the, uh, that the credit union industry remains safe and sound. Based on your progress so far, would you say that you're reactive or being proactive about uh, new technology in the space? My opinion is that I'm very proactive. Okay. You give us an example of something you've done that you believe is uh, uh, proactive? Um, a couple things that we're looking at, but I've had many conversations with the industry itself, with technology companies. Uh, one of the things that our board member started before I got there, but we're continuing, is to have a FinTech series where we invite FinTech companies into the NCUA to do a virtual presentation on their technology, how it's being used and how it's being used to enhance member services and financial inclusion. Would you say that the attitude of your office at this juncture is to try to facilitate uh, implementation of new technologies or do you approach them as a more in a more circumspect way? Um, our approach is because of the size of our office, is to make sure that we're having um, impact, that we're having relevance, and we're collaborating. So I think our main focus is those three things plus uh, maintaining that balance. Thank you. Ms. Murphy, last year the OCC solicited academic and policy-focused research on the impact of fintech entities on banking and the markets for lending, deposit taking, and payment services. Do you believe that a constructive dialogue with the financial industry is a good way to stay informed on new developments? Yes, I do. And does your office prioritize input from stakeholders when considering how to approach and regulate financial innovations? Yes, we do. And can you give me an example of how that's led to a productive outcome? So the Office of Financial Technology regularly engages with stakeholders across the industry. Uh, including both um, fintech companies, banks we supervise, consumer advocates, academics, as you mentioned. And we, we disseminate and make sure that that information is used to support our policy making and guidance. Um, for example, in the, um, the recent third party risk management guidance that was produced, the, uh, the Office of Financial Technology was supportive of the part of the agency that had the lead on that. Do you think, and kind of playing off the question I asked Mr. Vice, do you think that the posture of the agencies should be to be reactive to new developments or to be proactive in hastening their adoption? So I think it has to be a balance between the two. Uh, we are proactive in reaching out and engaging and ensuring that we're uh, keeping up with, with what's happening in the industry. It's a constantly evolving process, but we're also reacting to what's going on in terms of our banks approach the, their supervisory teams and we support their efforts to explore innovation, explore new financial technology, and then help to I ensure that they're identifying the risks and managing the risks that are associated with it. Based on what you've seen so far, what scares you the most uh, from a regulatory perspective that you see happening in the fintech innovation space? So I think that the challenges in the cybercrime area are the ones that we are most concerned about. Um, the criminals are constantly um, evolving their technology approaches, and there is you know, a need for the banks and the regulators to be constantly vigilant, which we are and are very much coordinated on an interagency basis in that area. And in keeping with that observation, do you think the OCC has the resources it needs to stay ahead of the fraudsters? So we are constantly updating and evolving our resources. Um, the, the challenges continue to change, and we continue to change with it. And I think we have good programs in place to make that happen. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nickel, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hill. Uh, happy birthday. Uh, also, thanks to Ranking Member Lynch. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sapanik, uh, as you know, I'm the Democratic lead on the Improving Disclosure for Investors Act, or e-delivery, uh, which passed out of this committee with bipartisan support and would make it easier for investors to receive documents electronically. Uh, this is a much needed innovation for consumers, businesses, and the environment. Two million trees a year we would save with, with just that one small change. 
In recent years, numerous government agencies have made great strides in minimizing wasteful paper usage. As far back as 2016, the Social Security Administration eliminated paper as the primary method of delivering statements to Americans. In 2020, the Department of Labor permitted e-delivery of 401k documents to retirement plan participants. In 2023, the Thrift Savings Plan defaulted to electronic delivery of quarterly statements. And the IRS, through its recent paperless processing initiative, as required under the Inflation Reduction Act, has already achieved the goal of enabling 94% of filers to send tax documents digitally. Ms. Ms. Sipanik, uh, knowing that an overwhelming majority, 79% of retail investors have opted to receive investment-related documents electronically, can you please explain why the SEC's rules still require an investor to receive paper documents when they open new investment accounts? And why hasn't your office pushed to update these rules? Thanks for the question. And I agree that evolving technologies can present new ways to have uh, investors interface with the markets, including with issuers and, and funds, for example. Um, and at the FinHub, we, we invite people to come in. We've had um, what we call peer-to-peer -peer meetups, and these are uh, events where we pull people in to talk about innovations in particular areas. One of those areas was in investor engagement and investor connected, connectedness to the markets and issuers. And so we will continue to pull people in and try to talk about new technologies in this area and, and invite staff around the commission who are thinking about things like disclosure uh, by issuers or funds as they think about potential rulemakings or changes to, to the rules of the commission. I, I mean, I thank you for your answer, but with, with respect, I, I'm just a little incredulous for, for, for your response and, and what the SEC is doing here. Um, you're the director of the strategic hub for innovation and financial technology. E-delivery was considered an innovation years ago. I'd argue that your office is behind at the expense of investors and our planet. So why aren't you focused specifically on this issue? So the, uh, the FinHub is not a policy-making part of the agency, nor is it a rule-making part. We provide the subject matter expertise to others at the agency, so I'll have to respectfully defer to them. Do you think we should be using e-delivery instead of paper? Like I said, there's, there's many technologies that we're uh, evaluating as they're coming, coming to market, and we'll continue to do that. I'm also concerned about the SEC's uh, proposed rule on predictive data analytics and the adverse effects it'll have on innovation and retail investors. The proposal's scope is extremely broad and could be applied to virtually any technology used by broker-dealers and investment advisors. The um, proposed rule seeks to eliminate the risk of investor harm resulting from conflicts of interest between financial institutions and clients. When working with AI, I, I agree, and I think that's a great goal. But this proposal, uh, uh, the, the scope, you know, the, the proposal would lead to higher costs for brokers and advisors, which will be passed along to investors, and fewer technology and online tools for investors. We need to lower rates of retail participation and financial inclusion. Um, Ms. Uh, Sapanik, how involved was your office in creating this rule? Like I said, when rulemaking uh, is undertaken by the staff at the commission, by the various divisions that undertake rulemaking, the FinHub is often called on to talk about the technology being considered. So we would provide technical assistance to staff working on rules about emerging technologies, how they work, how they're being used in the market, what risks they might present. So we've seen the reports explaining that the U.S. blockchain developer market is shrinking and that China is quickly advancing. The U.S. must remain the global leader in all segments of finance, including digital assets. This technology moving overseas only puts U.S. consumers at risk. Uh, in your role at FinHub, are you doing anything to promote innovation in blockchain technologies here in the U.S.? Sure. Um, we, we promote innovation in a number of ways. One of them is to invite folks like entrepreneurs and in, in, uh, innovators and their advisors to come talk to the staff about issues that they're facing, including in digital asset uh, distributed ledger technology. We also do a number of outreach events, uh, going to industry conferences, tech sprints, build-a-thons, that kind of thing, to encourage uh, beneficial innovation. Thank you. I've, I've expired my time, um, and uh, we'll follow up in writing. Uh, yield Thank back. you. Thank you, Mr. Nickel. Your time has inspired. Now we turn to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Flood. 
for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, happy birthday from everybody in Nebraska. I'd like to focus my questions today on the Federal Reserve's Novel Activities Program. Uh, this supervision program applies to all banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System, regardless of size. The Federal Reserve would require state member banks to go through a supervisory non-objection process in order to issue stable coins or custody digital assets. I specifically have interest in this topic and this program because I wrote and passed legislation in Nebraska as a state senator there that would allow state chartered banks to custody digital assets and legislation that would also allow state chartered banks to issue stable coins. Um, the Federal Reserve has published five broad parameters it will use to determine the relative risk of these activities. I'd like to start with uh, a kudos and a thank you. I reached out to Kelly Lammers, the director of the Nebraska Department of Banking in advance of this hearing. Uh, he assured me that he's been in very productive conversations with the Federal Reserve on the Novel Activities Program. Um, I thank you for maintaining an open dialogue with the state of Nebraska. I'm exceptionally proud of our Department of Banking and uh, Nebraska is a leader on this issue. So, um, Dr. Gibson, I would uh, say thank you. Um, just to kind of get into the questions here, the Nebraska Department of Banking's already issued several examination manuals that walk through how to comply with state law in great detail. They know these issues very well and they're already working on solutions that create a pathway for innovation while also ensuring safety and soundness of the banks in our state. Uh, Dr. Gibson, can banks expect further guidance on exactly how the Federal Reserve non-objection process will work and will more guidance and examination manuals be issued and will those be publicly available? So all of our examination materials are public publicly available and we have issued guidance and statements around the supervisory non-objection process to try to make it clear to firms if they want to investigate that or undertake that activity what's the steps they can what are the steps they can go through and we do partner with the states because as a supervisor of state member banks we're always uh, in partnership with the state supervisor on our examinations and our oversight do you do you foresee uh, more guidance coming out or Federal Reserve pretty confident with what, it, what it has right now? Uh, I mean, we're always looking at areas where more uh, transparency or explanation could be helpful, but we have issued quite a few guidance statements over the past year or two in this area. So for now, there's nothing imminent, imminently coming out, no. Uh, when you put together these guidance uh, for banks across the state or the nation, do you look to state laws to, to see where they're at, uh, states like Nebraska, to kind of give you an idea uh, as to how you should put your program together? So if we're uh, examining a particular new activity, you know, we're going to be doing that in, in the context of state member bank supervision. We are going to be partnering with states, and we feed back what we learn from those exam activities into our guidance and policy process. So, so we're always learning from what's happening out in the states, uh, and we take that into account when we make our own guidance. How many examiners are dedicated to the Novel Activities Program? Uh, if the number of banks interested in these activities increase due to state pathways being created across the country, will the Federal Reserve have the resources and the bandwidth uh, to um, be able to examine these institutions and work with them? Uh, I think, I think we will. So far, we have allocated dedicated examiners to our Novel activity Supervision Program, and they've got special uh, specialized training in these activities. So we are using those examiners already on exams, partnering with our local supervisory teams. And if, that's, if that activity scaled up, we would plan to add more resources. And I find that interesting because, you know, we, we could be looking at a new pool of applicants for examiners given the digital um, innovation effort, where do you see that coming from? And, and when you look to hire new examiners, are you finding a renewed interest in, in this area, given that we're talking about digital currency, digital assets? We've, we've staffed our novel activities program mostly with internal uh, examiners who have some expertise and then get more training. We also hire from outside as well, so it's a mix for us. Well, it makes sense. It sounds safe and sound. So I appreciate your work. I appreciate you having and maintaining such a good dialogue with the state that I represent. Uh, seeing that federal state partnership is important and you should be credited for doing that. With that, thank you and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the ranking member of the full committee, Mrs. Waters of California, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so very much. Um, I guess I would like to 
I'll direct this question to Mr. Senpak, Senpatic. Uh, we have recently seen another large crypto company, Binance, held accountable for breaking the law. This time, Binance knowingly engaged in money laundering, violated US sanctions, and did not register as a money transmitter. For example, it knowingly refused to report more than 100,000 suspicious transactions to law enforcement. Binance has been ordered to pay $4 billion, which includes the largest fine ever for Treasury to levy uh, to settle various criminal violations. And its CEO has pled guilty to criminal charges. This comes on the heels of Sam Bankman Fried's conviction for stealing from FTX customers. This also comes after the SEC filed a lawsuit against Binance and its US subsidiary for the sale of unregistered securities, fraud, conflicts of interest, and lack of disclosure. How does the SEC's FinHub research and evaluate illicit activity in the crypto system? How do you assist the SEC in ensuring that other bad actors in the crypto space are held accountable? Thank you for the question. FinHub and its staff are made up not only of attorneys, but also specialists in computer science, in uh, data analytics, and in um, financial analysis. And we use those skills and special resources to scan the market. So we understand what's happening in the digital asset market. We have the tools and technology that we need to do so. And we, we uh, are looking proactively to analyze trends that we see that may, prevent, may present harms to investors in the market. And we're passing that information along to our colleagues who are engaging in the activities of the commission, for example, in examinations or in enforcement or in um, the rulemaking divisions as they consider what needs to be done to protect investors in the markets. We also participate as, as subject matter experts on a number of uh, domestic and international uh, bodies that are addressing such things like the FSB and IOSCO and the FATF. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask what could be a sensitive question, uh, but I hope you would try and help me with this. These crypto companies are coming uh, to a Congress and to members of Congress. Some members of Congress are truly interested in the role that crypto is going to play um, in the world, and particularly you know, in the United States. Many of them need more information. They need more education. Have any of you thought about holding some special sessions with members of Congress to talk about um, the, uh, the problems and the pitfalls uh, that may occur and give some information that would help them not to believe that somehow uh, they should be advancing or even advocating because maybe they just don't know enough. How could you help us with that? So we are happy to provide uh, technical assistance when that assistance uh, through our Office of Legislative Affairs. Um, and so I would invite uh, members to reach out to OLIA at SEC if, if they want technical assistance on such matters. Uh, do you know whether or not um, crypto companies are uh, making huge contributions to members of Congress? I can't comment about any particular. Uh, I said it was gonna be sensitive. Uh, but what other ways can you help us? Uh, that's a great question. So we stand ready to provide any technical assistance um, through our Office of Legislative Affairs. And um, the FinHub itself provides a repository of information uh, concerning activities that the Commission engages in with respect to distributed ledger technology, digital assets, and a number of other technologies on our FinHub, FinHub website. So there are a number of resources there. Well, I thank you for being here today, and I appreciate your testimony, but I would like to try and organize a small groups of Congress uh, to be able to ask more questions and get more involved in what is really going on with some of these companies. And so if any of you are willing uh, to participate at any time with smaller groups where you can answer more specific questions, I would appreciate it very much. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, for five minutes. Hey, Mr. Chairman. The Office of Innovation was created by the CFPB in 2018 during the tenure of then-acting director Mick Mulvaney. 
Uh, its primary objective was to focus on creating policies to facilitate innovation, uh, engaging with entrepreneurs and regulators, and reviewing outdated or unnecessary regulations. However, in 22, uh, Director Chopra replaced this entity with the Office of Competition and Innovation, making a departure from its predecessor's focus. The new office is more inclined toward generating reports termed issue spotlights, uh, which concentrate on specific innovative products and services. The hallmarks of the CFPB's office, uh, former Office of Innovation were the <coughs> No Action Letter and Compliance Assistance San Sandbox programs, both of which eliminated regulatory uncertainty by allowing companies to offer innovative financial products to consumers upon approval from the Bureau. In September of 22, both policies uh, were allowed to expire under the current leadership. Uh, Ms. Epstein, uh, do you believe that letting these policies expire will facilitate innovation within the financial industry? And what policies has the office introduced to foster an opportune environment for innovative companies and products in the wake of the no action letter and sandbox programs expiring? Thank you for the question. Um, so first, I, I did want to point out that we still do have the um, only federal level sandbox um, that's, uh, that is in existence. And as I mentioned in my testimony, we do have a current approval, um, recent approval, for the Independent Community Bankers of America um, to test uh, disclosures related to construction loans, um, which is, um, I think, a very exciting um, place where we can uh, innovate with the, you know, with the um, community bankers to understand where there might be improvements in the disclosures. So are you saying that the Sandbox program did not expire, or you've replaced it with something similar? There were um, multiple Sandbox policies. So that Sandbox is still in effect, and we have a current approval. Unfortunately, for the two um, policies that you did mention, um, they unfortunately did not yield in implementation the expected results. So they were um, sort of in summary higher costs than we had expected. They, um, the benefits were a little more illusory. And then the other piece of this, which um, was an inadvertent side effect, was that we created um, advantages for the companies in the sandbox in a competitive environment which was not an expected or desirable outcome. It seems we're moving in the wrong direction, so um, I, thank you for that. The CFPB's Office of Competition and Innovation has a broader initiative than its predecessor, uh, the former Office of Innovation. Can you describe how this expanded mandate has impacted the office's interaction with market participants? So, I mean, just generally speaking, are, are we making it easier uh, for, for people to compete, uh, or is it more regulation and, and, and less streamlining the challenges that they face? So we continue to engage um, very fulsomely with the entire fintech ecosystem um, and try to understand on a very broad level what the, what the barriers to, to new entrants are. We talk to um, fintech companies, we talk to venture capitalists, seeing where the money is going, um, where, um, where they see on sort of a broad level some of these things um, are of issue. We talk to bankers, we talk to um, large groups in the industry. The focus is more on a market level as opposed to a particular fintech. So, Well, I, I appreciate your comments, but I still have concerns about the, the office's new direction. Um, I, I've introduced legislation to revert this office back to its original form, and I urge your office to once again adopt the no action letter and sandbox policies that were previously in effect that laid the groundwork for innovative companies to thrive. Um, one final question. The CFPB uh, is not does not seem to be uh, feeling the Christmas cheer this year. Uh, two crucial comment periods come to an end right after the holidays. Uh, can the CFPB and Director Chopra commit to saving Christmas by providing comment period extensions for both its uh, 1033 and large participant pr proposals? Uh, so I am not the rulemaking team, but I am sure that uh, the rulemaking team will take all extension requests seriously. I think some more time would be appropriate. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stiles, recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for holding today's hearing. Uh, financial innovations helped uh, millions of Americans uh, navigate wealth, make payments, manage their cash flow. Um, and I think a lot of the technological developments we've had have been incredibly um, positive. I think the real key here is that we're working uh, with the regulatory bodies uh, as we are in policymakers 
uh, to provide clarity, to allow innovation to develop um, here in the United States, uh, and that we have a pro-innovation uh, perspective of this. I want to start with you, if I can, uh, Ms. Epstein. Um, the CFPB has proposed uh, new rules for popular fintech products and services, and some of these regulations, in my opinion, will have a significant impact um, on the development of products and on competition broadly. Um, I'm interested in your role at the CFPB in how you interact with the CFPB rulemaking process. Could you walk us through your involvement uh, with that in the context of the larger picture of navigating the rulemaking process at CFPB uh, in your role of assisting in innovation? Sure. Uh, so um, my office is uh, part of the regulations, monitoring, and research division at the CFPB. We fall under the monitoring category. Uh, so along with the statutory offices uh, in markets, which look at specific market segments, as well as the populations teams, which look at specific populations and the impact of, um, of uh, on particularly things like, you know, military service members and older Americans and so forth. We um, are specifically looking at some of the more longer term, um, you know, and technological aspects. L let let me dive in if I can, because I, I like where you're going, but we're limited in time. But as it relates to the CFPB rulemaking process, do you opine on the impact that that would have on future technological developments? So very similar to my colleague, it, it depends on the regulation itself, but we do um, offer technical assistance related to various rulemakings, uh, particularly in terms of So maybe, maybe I can use like an example then. So if uh, CFPB, we had Director Chopra in uh, a couple days ago. Um, he was talking about CFPB is examining earn wage access uh, under a new light. It's a highly developing um, area where people have access to their wages that they've already earned. Um, do you have conversations with your colleagues? What, is that, what does that look like as it relates to a area that's innovating quickly? Yeah, um, so we do, uh, for example, in earned wage access, do provide um, information about where the market is developing, the different business models. But do you provide comments as it relates to whether or not a rule would actually hinder uh, innovation or development? We would have input into a rule. You would. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you very much. I'm going to shift gears if I can just because we're limited um, in time and jump over to our friends at the SEC, uh, Mr. Sunpaki. Um, in your opening statement, we were talking about um, kind of FinHub actively monitors international fintech developments, engages in dialogue with uh, foreign counterparts. Um, can you describe any of the, can you note, can you note any of the, the specific foreign developments that you're seeing from your foreign counterparts uh, that we should be looking at developing in the United States? Sure. In FinHub, we're actively monitoring developments as they occur both domestically and internationally. We get involved um, as subject matter experts in the various uh, work that's being done by inter international bodies that the SEC is involved with. For example, the Financial Stability Board, IOSCO, and the FATF. Um, and what I'm seeing is a broad consensus internationally about the risks that certain technologies are, propo are proposing. And I do see a broad consensus around responses to the risks. And, and you see, great, so let's, let's dive in. So you see a broad consensus in responses. Do you see that in a regulatory framework being set forward uh, or in favor of an enforcement uh, first approach? What, what I see is that there are high level recommendations being uh, put forth by these uh, authorities that really talk about same activities, same risks, same regulation, and that, that is a guiding principle as well as technology neutrality. But, but in the, the, the enforcement first approach that I think the SEC has taken, do you see your foreign counterparts engaging in a similar light? What I see is that uh, there's a broad consensus internationally about the risks posed by new technologies. But, but not a broad consensus about how those risks should be managed, meaning whether or not a regulatory framework being set forward as we have here uh, in Congress legislation that we've moved on, hopefully the Senate would act on. Um, I think that's a better approach than the regulatory first approach we've seen at the SEC. With the time, I'll yield back. Gentleman from Wisconsin yields back. I want to thank our good panel today. Congratulate you on your work and innovation in your agencies in a safe and sound way. We look forward to you uh, 
Following up, uh, without objection, all members will have a five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask each of you to please respond as promptly as you are able. This committee is adjourned.